It's now my pleasure to um, hand over the podium to the chair of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Please help me welcome Bill Roscoe. Thank you, Pierre. Just have to find the right place in the script here. Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the board of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, thank you for joining us at our annual induction ceremony and 30th anniversary celebration. And thank you, Pierre, for being our MC for the 17th year. Not only are you a member of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame yourself, you add a real note of color to this evening and your presence is essential both to our event and to our industry. I would also like to shine a spotlight on several other Hall of Famers who are in the attendance here tonight. So members of the Hall of Fame, could you please stand or wave to be recognized when I call your name? Norman Keevil. <laughs> Mac Watson. Uh, Gren Thomas. Peter Bradshaw. Robert Friedland. Mike Nucky. Ron Nedelitsky. Mark Rebliati. Bert Wasmond. Bill James. Rob McEwen. Ian Telfer. And uh, Graham Parkerson, who's sitting at the head table. And in addition this evening, we're honored to have the Honorable Bob McLeod, who is the Premier of the Northwest Territories, who's here uh, in honor of Bob Gannicott. Sadly, this year we lost a member and a friend, Don McLeod, an industry legend who was inducted last year. Don will be missed. May he rest in peace. If you're enjoying yourselves this evening, be sure to thank our sponsors. Without their vision, this wonderful evening of celebration would not be possible. Here's a short video to say thank you to our platinum sponsors. We would like to take this opportunity to thank this year's platinum sponsors. Barrick, a global gold mining company and longtime supporter of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Franco, Nevada, a prominent Canadian royalty and streaming company. Magris Resources, a developer and operator of global mining assets. Nexa Resources, a large-scale, low-cost zinc producer headquartered in Brazil. Pear Tree Securities, a subsidiary of Pear Tree Financial Services Limited, the originator and leading provider of flow-through share donation financing services in Canada. Yamana Gold, a Canadian-based gold producer with operations in Canada and South America, and Syncrude Canada, one of the largest operators in Canada's oil sands industry. Syncrude has also generously sponsored the new Canadian Mining Hall of Fame trophies. Thank you. As the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, we're enormously proud to celebrate 30 years of greatness in the Canadian mining industry and all that we've achieved together over the past three decades. Before we pay tribute to four very accomplished inductees this evening, we believe it's important to reflect back with gratitude on the late Maurice Brown, 
former editor and publisher of the Northern Miner, who conceived the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame in 1988. He recognized the need to honor the legendary characters who laid the foundation of our business, to inspire the future generations of mining professionals, and to build an enduring source of information about the people who have made significant contributions to mining. Mort himself was recognized as one such character when he was inducted into the hall in 1993. Mort Brown convinced our member organizations, the Northern Miner, the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, the Mining Association of Canada, and the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada to sponsor the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame with annual financial support and staff. In later years, we won the support of our associate member organizations, the Association of Mineral Exploration BC and the Mining Associations of British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. Mort undeniably believed that mining is a global industry and that Canada is its leader. We're proud to continue to champion our industry and the achievements of its leaders today. Tonight, we stand proud at the forefront of mining finance, exploration, production, and sustainable development. The Canadian capital markets raise the vast majority of global mining equity capital, most of it around the corner on Bay Street, the global hub of mining finance. The TSX and TSX Venture Exchanges are home to 57% of the world's publicly listed mining companies and account for 62% of global mining equity raised. We also attract more exploration dollars than anywhere else in the world. Last year, Canada attracted 14% of global exploration spending, with Australia close second at 13%, and the US a distant third at 7%. Canada ranks in the top five nations for global production of many important minerals and metals. Canadian mining companies are also in the forefront of innovation in the mining industry. We set the global benchmark for sustainable and responsible development. Our mining industry was the first in the world to develop an externally verified performance system for sustainable mining practices through the Mining Association of Canada initiative towards sustainable mining. TSM has now been adopted by four international mining jurisdictions, underscoring the program's growing importance. The mining industry is constantly evolving and we congratulate the leaders who guide and stay on pace with this change. It's now time the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame does so also. Tonight when we have unveiled a refreshed look to celebrate our 30th anniversary and our industry's prominence as global leaders. To us, it is a crystal clear statement that Canada's leaders are the champions of global mining, and Canada is setting the trend for mining excellence and leadership around the world. Here's our new logo. And you can see it at the ends of the room here as well. It is now time to honor those whose outstanding contributions have played their part in guiding Canada's mining industry to global prominence while building a legacy that they and all of us can be very proud of a legacy we must all commit to continuing. I now welcome Pierre back to the podium to begin our induction ceremony. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, it's really been a true joy of, you know, of mine to have uh, been able to uh, do this job for the last 17 years. I really enjoy it, and it's so uh, so much a pleasure for me to see all of you from the industry and all friends and that are here to celebrate the very best of what Canada does in a great way throughout the world. Um, and uh, I just want, you know, to, to have seen the audience grow from uh, 400 to over, you know, 1,225 tonight over the last 17 years has been incredible to me. And thank you very much for being here tonight and attending. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to point out that our um, oldest uh, member of the um, Canadian Mining uh, Hall of Fame is uh, here tonight, and it's uh, Bill James. Bill's going to be 90 years old next year. Yeah. Um, Bill, Bill is, is so old, he got a letter from the Red Cross telling him that they're going to retire his blood type. He says it doesn't matter because it's B negative. <laughs> um, we also have uh, Norm Keevil, as you know, in uh, the, um, the, the audience tonight. And I just want to say, 
that last year, if you were here, um, you would have had the uh, privilege of paying $5,000 for his, an advanced copy of his new book, uh, Never Rest on Your Oars. Um, the book is out. It's a fabulous book. I've read it cover to cover. And I can tell you one thing, um, you better buy it because you all wish you'd read it 40 years ago. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to induct four giants of our industry into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Our first inductee this evening, Edward G. Thompson. Relax and enjoy this video about Ed's work, philanthropic contributions, and much more. Ed Thompson has deep roots, both in Ontario and the mining industry. With a career spanning almost 60 years, Ed has served as the bedrock on which many successful companies, organizations, and friendships have been built. He's just one of those guys that keeps people together. I think, I think the whole industry is like his family. He's Mr. Straight Arrow, actually. And uh, he's, he's the glue that holds people together. First and foremost, he is a leader. He's very, you know, he's an astute businessman. He's very fair uh, and very, uh, you know, I think understanding of other people's points of view. Ed's great-grandparents were homesteaders in the Muskoka area of Ontario in the mid-1800s. My great-grandfather, John Thompson, left the family farm north of Toronto in 1868. He and his young wife and my grandfather, who was four or five, uh, loaded up the ox team and uh, spent eight or nine days um, uh, moving up to the area north of Bracebridge where they uh, claimed some land at Beatrice and tried to make a living. Ed was born in Utterson in 1936. Losing his mother at age seven, he was no stranger to hardship. Well, it was, uh, we were subsistent uh, farmers. Uh, my dad really couldn't read or write, so he worked in the lumber mill and, and we grew our own vegetables and had a few farm animals, so we survived, but barely, it was very tough. From 13 to 16 years old, Ed worked summers in a lumber mill. His first exposure to geology came at 16, while he was river driving logs to the pulp mills for Abitibi. There was a lithium boom, and then the uh, supervisors were running around with the pieces of spodumene in their hands and staking claims, and I thought that might be a, uh, an interesting occupation, and uh, uh, late that summer, I got an offer to go into uh, University of Toronto, and I, I went in and uh, registered for geological engineering. Never got out of it. After graduating, Ed spent 10 years with the Kievel Mining Group, which is now Tech Resources. He got us into the property that became Newfoundland Zinc. He was instrumental in getting the, the Niobia mine and uh, work deposit in uh, near Chicoutimi that we built jointly with Soquim, the Quebec government mining company. He was involved with the deal that got us into Bermuda, which indirectly got us into coal. Um, which, without which we wouldn't be the second largest coal producer in the world today. From the Keevil Mining Group, Ed went on together with Bill Gross to create Lacana Mining Corporation, which developed a number of producing mines. We developed uh, six uh, gold-silver mines in Mexico and uh, we worked in Nevada in the U.S. and over that time period we were involved through various syndicates with eight other small gold mines in Nevada. During his career, Ed worked with over 50 companies and been involved with over 40 mines. It's amazing the number of properties that other companies get a hold of. And, you know, Ed, Ed has already been there. He was there 20 or 30 years ago. So, you know, he's, he's, he's very well known, very well respected in the industry as a whole. It's always very satisfactory to go to a mine opening. I went to many of them over the years and uh, it's nice to see it because it's a lot of effort. To, and often it takes 20 or 25 years to, uh, to get the mine going. Well, he's not a promoter. He's, an, he's a true engineer, engineer's engineer. He's a, he's a doer. He's not a procrastinator. If Nike hadn't invented the, the phrase, just do it, Ed would have, because that's, I think, one of his talents. He just gets it done. Ed was always one step ahead, whether it was developing a computer program to aid property evaluation, using the latest surveying techniques, or introducing heap bleaching 
at Lacana's Pinson Mine. Over the years, Ed has given generously both time and money to industry and charitable organizations, including his family church and the Marie Thompson Gallbladder Research Fund at the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation, named for his first wife, who passed away in 2009. With the PDAC and with the Mining Hall of Fame and with Mining Matters, all of these things, it's a credit to him, he's, what he's done for the industry. Ed was instrumental in founding the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame and has done more than anyone over the last 30 years to make it a successful institution for the Canadian mining industry. It's been a great success, though we struggled in the first 10 years and uh, now we have a sellout crowd with a thousand people uh, every year. Ed has been involved with the PDAC since 1957, over the years serving as Vice President, President and Chair of the Convention Committee and he started the annual awards. So we went from essentially an Ontario-based prospecting group to a worldwide organization with 24, 25,000 people attending the convention yearly from 110 countries around the world. I had a great time for about 40 years chairing the awards committee so that uh, very satisfactory giving out awards to people that have, have achieved, uh, uh, you know, substantial objectives in the business. Anne has always been strongly committed to family and now gets to enjoy more time with them since his recent retirement at 81 years old. I'm not too busy these days. Uh, Sailing and I are just enjoying life and grandchildren and, uh, and doing a fair amount of traveling. That's, uh, that's, uh, I think I've earned it. <laughs> And here to present the award to Ed Thompson is uh, Rod Thomas, General Manager of Nexa Resources and also Treasurer of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Please, Ed and Rod, come to the podium. What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. Not to say the things that he truly feels. Thank you for the uh, promotion, Pierre, and uh, I'd just like to say I've worked with Ed, uh, principally the PDAC, but also with some of those juniors that he's been involved with, and I consider Ed to be a, a great friend and mentor, and Ed, it's uh, with a privilege and honor I present this award to you. Welcome to the Mining, Canadian Mining. Mining Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Wow, what a crowd we got here tonight. <laughs> Honored head table guests, chairman, MC, Pierre, fellow inductees, past inductees, ladies and gentlemen, friends and relatives. Welcome to uh, Toronto and our two-day heat wave regarding uh, uh, <laughs> I was quite interested to see how that video would turn out because uh, uh, that segment, segment, they were at our house for uh, a full nine hour, from nine to five, and then they had to work in the interviews with Rod and Norm, so I was wondering how they were gonna piece it all together, and uh, they did a good job. We started those videos uh, seven or eight years ago to speed up the proceedings, and uh, they're well liked. Uh, a little expensive, though. That's why your dinner costs three hundred dollars. Is because the, <laughs> that video cost us fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars. So uh, I hope you liked it. <laughs> I guess it's worth it, though, and it was that complimentary. Uh, so we'll vote to keep it. <laughs> when Mort Brown called me some thirty years ago and said, uh, "Ed, I think we need our own mining hall of fame." We'd both just come back from one in the U.S. Hall of Fame, and uh, I said, Mort, I was thinking the same thing, let's do it. And he uh, said, will the PDA support it? I was chair of the awards committee at the time. And uh, I said, Mort, I'm sure they will. Let's uh, 
get some other people involved. So we called around, and mainly Mort. You couldn't say no to Mort. So we got the CIM and MAC and a couple other groups. And uh, just within a month or two, we got it, we got it going. And then we had to play catch up for uh, many years because uh, we were 50, late, 50 years late starting it. So uh, I've been involved with the Mining Hall of Fame since the start and uh, had a hand in electing many of the nominees and therefore I know what a great honor it is to uh, be now included with that group. We struggled for the first 10 years or so uh, but then found as MC uh, a likable uh, French-Canadian chap with a sort of a quirky sense of humor. And the audience loved him, and uh, he's a big reason that we now have sellout crowds. So please give a warm hand to our longtime MC, <laughs> Monsieur Pierre. Where are you? He keeps threatening to retire on us every year, so I urge you all to encourage him to, uh, to stay with us. Firstly, I would like to thank my uh, friends that helped induct me tonight uh, to Norm for uh, his strong nomination letter and his laudatory video comments, and Rod and, and Bob for stick handling uh, my support letters and the some 30 friends or so that, uh, that uh, wrote them. So thanks very much, people. In my short time tonight, I want to stress the importance of friends and family. In my 60 years in business and in various associated organizations like the Mining Hall of Fame and Prospectors and Developers Association and Mining Matters, I made hundreds of lifelong friends which I very value very highly. And my four kids are here tonight, Steve, Cheryl, Chris, and uh, Karen over here, and three of uh, their spouses, Anthony, Allison, and Jason are here as well, and Saley's son David and spouse Lindsay, and my brother-in-law Ken and wife Irene are with me tonight. My family has been the delight of my life, and especially now my seven grandkids. If many of you here have grandchildren, you know what I'm talking about. My wife Marie uh, of some 50 years passed away nine years ago. And she was the, really the rock that kept our family together as I traveled the world. Uh, my second wife, Sally, is a wonderful partner in the second phase of my journey. And I've been very fortunate to have known the love of these two wonderful ladies uh, over my lifetime. I want to talk a little bit about friendships and can only name a few of many. I started my career at the Keeble Mining Group that later morphed into a Tech Corporation and made many friends there over the 10 years I was there in the early days. Norm and his father, Norm Sr., Joe Franz, Fred Sharpley, Dave Brown, Doug Fraser, Bob Hallbauer, just to name a few. At La Canna for 15 years, Bill Gross, Harvey Sobel, Mike Easton, Lee Barker, Gord Allen, they merit special mention. In my five years at Anglo-American, John Ellis, Larry Lackey, and Uli Rath, they stand out. And I must mention some of the people at the junior companies I was involved with. Free West Resources with Mac Watson, we had fun in the Ring of Fire. Consolidated Thompson were Jerry McCarvel and Stan Barty turned an old iron deposit into a $5 billion company. Orvana Minerals with Neil Hillhouse and Ron Bradshaw and others. Spartan Resources with Lee down here. Golden Queen with Lutz Klingman and Chester Chinkarik. Chariot Resources with Uli Rath and John Kukovic, yes, that are here tonight with me. We had a big copper project in Peru. First Exploration Flow Through Fund with Bill White we raised 85 million or so for junior company financings. The Ray Rock group of companies with Dave Crombie and Dave Hutton. And of course, the Cordex syndicates with John Livermore. Thanks everyone for all the interesting projects 
that we developed in your friendships and your memories. For the last 25 years of my career, I was lucky to rent office space with Roscoe Postal and Associates and much enjoyed the friendship of John and Bill as well as Debbie and Graham, Luke, Jason, many others. And they've got a couple tables here tonight, I believe. I've also been a member of the Prospect Club for some 50 years. We lunch and discuss junior mining stocks a couple times a month. And a bunch of them are here tonight. Love you guys. I also have to mention our National Club Wednesday lunch group that uh, are here tonight, uh, Jerry and John and all sitting over in this corner. I'm sorry that time does not allow me to uh, list all the lawyers and brokers and service people <coughs> that uh, have enriched my life. <laughs> But I, I have to mention three lifelong friends. My old CIBC banker, Don Wirth, that's here tonight. Uh, Don. <laughs> my legal friend, Steve Vaughn, who's also inductee into the Hall of Fame. And my mining consultant friend, Graham Farquharson, down at the far end of the table. <laughs> Dozens of people uh, in three mining organizations became lifelong friends. Firstly, the Prospectors and Developers Association. One of my early jobs with Tech Hughes was to uh, manage grub stakes for prospectors. So I became friends with uh, quite a number of them with the Prospectors Association. In those days, in the early 60s, it was strictly an association of prospectors. They got me involved, but uh, they had to change the bylaws in 1970 before I be could become a director. They, they had this quirky idea that engineers shouldn't become involved in the Prospectors Association. So I went on the board and got more involved. And some of you might remember that time it was essentially a volunteer organization. I became VP in 1975 and president in 77, and pretty much stayed involved ever since. We had 48 directors at that time, plus five regional vice presidents, and many of them became lifelong friends. I just want to thank them for their friendship. People like Viola, Jim Walker, Clark Campbell, Andy Troop, Ruthie, somewhere here tonight, and more recently, John Hansel and Rod Thomas and John Baird, Tony Andrews, Lisa McDonald. It's marvelous to see the great impact that the PDAC now has and the convention of over 20,000 delegates from around the world. Because of my PDAC uh, connections, I became involved in two other organizations, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame and Mining Matters. As mentioned earlier, I was involved to, in the hall from day one, and I just wanted to thank all the directors, we have 12 directors there, who have over the last 30 years really put in a great effort to make this a successful event and publicizing the importance of mining in our way of living. We are still working on establishing Canadian Mining Hall of Fame displays in museums across Canada. And if any of you can help us uh, get into some of these museums, uh, please contact Becky Bays. And lastly, I want to mention mining matters. Those of you that were here last year remember the fabulous money-raising event that we did, thanks to Norm and his book. We raised over $600,000 to help educate our kids to the importance of mining and minerals in our society. I strongly believe in this cause and have worked with Pat Dillon and Laura Clinton and many others over the last 25 years to get this message to our young people. If we want the social license to mine, we have to tell our story and convince the kids. And we have to raise money every year, so please be generous when someone calls on you for a donation to Mining Matters. Well, that's all for me, folks. Thanks for the wonderful memories and for your friendship. Enjoy the rest of the evening, and back to you, Pierre.
Congratulations, Ed. You know, he's already named half the room here. I was afraid he was going to go for the other half. <laughs> all right. Um, so, all right. Our next video honors the life and work of Robert A. Gannicott. Here's to Robert. Robert Gannicott was a modern pioneer, equally at home in a tent on an icy outcrop or a finely appointed boardroom. Bob was a very versatile guy, uh, hands-on in the trenches with the people working in the field, but also very creative from an entrepreneurial standpoint. He wasn't worried about hardship or living in harsh conditions or getting his hands dirty. He was very, very resourceful. If I had to describe the man, I would say he's a benevolent, tenacious visionary. He was always looking for the solutions, and that was one of the one of the reasons why he was so successful, because he never really gave up about uh, thinking about these sorts of things and what to do next. Very much uh, he was a visionary, he was entrepreneurial, he was imaginative, he was uh, very, very focused once he got an idea in his head. Born in Sanford, Somerset, in England, Robert Gannicott developed his love for geology while exploring caves as a teenager. In 1967, Bob left school in England and headed to Canada. He took a boat to Montreal, got a train to Winnipeg, uh, was out of money, young guy, uh, you know, 19, 18, 19 years old. And he uh, basically managed to get himself to Edmonton by loaning his watch to the ticket agent in the Winnipeg train station. And he actually did go back and get his watch back. From Edmonton, Bob made his way to Yellowknife to start his first job as a geological technician at the giant gold mine. He went back to school, graduating from the University of Ottawa in 1974 with a degree in geology. That led to a job at Cominco as an exploration geologist where he worked for 12 years before founding his own company, Platanova. Platanova focused on exploration in Greenland. We didn't sleep very much. I mean, I can remember getting by on four hours sleep most of the nights. We'd go to bed at three or four in the morning, get up at seven, have breakfast, and go to work. In 1994, Platanova discovered a major lead zinc deposit showing near Citronin Fjord on the northern tip of Greenland at 83 degrees north about the same latitude as the most northerly point of land in Arctic Canada. Working for him was, uh, was just delightful because he was, uh, had so much energy, he was a, he was a visionary, and uh, his mind just never stopped. Bob's next adventure took him back to the Northwest Territories in 1992 exploring for diamonds, staking claims near the diamond minerals find at Lac de Gras. Aber Diamond Corporation was formed, partnering with West Viking. We used all the money in the West Viking treasury to stake claims tying onto the diamond discovery. And uh, we ended up with about 250,000 acres. And uh, the project evolved through uh, uh, basically a series of joint ventures, ultimately uh, bringing uh, Kennecott Canada, which was a subsidiary of Rio Tinto, in as the major financial partner. On breaking the core from the A154 pipe, they discovered a two and a half carat diamond. When the bulk sample was taken at, uh, on the A154 pipe, there was about a 22,000 plus carat parcel of diamonds that uh, had to be uh, properly sorted and evaluated. And Bob uh, poured over these diamonds ad nauseum, I know that. I think he had names for them all. Bob's passion to know more about the industry and pricing led Aber to purchase luxury diamond retailer Harry Winston. After several years, Swatch purchased Harry Winston, providing the funds to purchase the Akati Diamond Mine, and the company was renamed 
Dominion Diamonds. And so that consolidation put now the new name Dominion Diamonds into a position of being a, one of the world's largest rough diamond producers and Canadian based, which you know Bob was firstly, firstly passionate about making sure this was a Canadian uh, situation. Bob Gannicott passed away in 2016 following a two-year battle with leukemia. His strong presence is still felt in the North, both in his company and in the community. A number of years ago, Bob established a foundation. And uh, in his will, uh, last will and testament, he left considerable sum of money to the foundation, which is to be used for youth in the Northwest Territory. So he loved the territories. I think what people should know is that his inspiration, his vision and his imagination, his foresight, all those things uh, really is what we're trying to uh, maintain as part of Dominion's DNA today. I think that if, if he were with us today, he would be very, very happy that this, this is the leadership that's taking of the Dominion Group forward. And here to present the award to Inez Ganicott is Graham Farguson, President Stratgora, Stratgona Minerals and the member and director of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Inez and Graham, please step to the podium. Pierre, if I can have the podium for just a moment or two here. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have traveled and worked with Bob uh, on many of his northern projects. I can remember standing with him on the very northern tip of Greenland that was mentioned in the video at 83 degrees of latitude, and there was a link showing there that Bob and his Platanova team had found, and what are we going to do with it? But the thing that most impressed me most about Bob was his was when he became involved with diamonds, together with uh, Lee Barker and Gwen Thomas, who are both here tonight, was Bob's uh, dedication and determination to have a significant Canadian presence in the amazing story of the discovery of world-class diamond deposits in the Northwest Territories. And Bob succeeded in doing that big time. He even had an incredible diamond sorting facility established here in Canada for the first time ever, which I will never forget touring with Bob. Before his very difficult exit um, last year, at the young age of 69, uh, Bob created the Robert Gannicott Foundation uh, to support the indigenous peoples of the North with whom he had a, a lot of goodwill. Uh, this evening, we are very pleased and honored to have with us Inez uh, Gannicott uh, to participate in, in, in the induction of a most remarkable individual into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Inez, it's here somewhere. Yeah, it's right here. <laughs> And if you want to make a few comments, you go ahead. On behalf of Bob, I'd like to thank the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame for his nomination. Recognition of one's achievements and one's chosen profession by one's peer is the most rewarding honor Bob could have received. Most importantly, this nomination would not have happened 
at an op-ed for Lee Barker's ceaseless and untiring pursuit on Bob's behalf. I know he is humble in receiving this award, and on his behalf and myself, we thank you. I also wish to thank those who wrote letters nominating Bob. They learned that the elements would not hinder him from pushing forward to complete the task at hand in satisfying his ceaseless curiosity and imagination. This was best expressed in Kent Brooks' nominating letter. So true, Kent. I shall not bore you unnecessarily re by reiterating Bob's past achievements, as it has been repeated numerous times again this evening, and uh, numerous times and again this evening. Upon graduation from the University of Ottawa, Bob moved forward with what he loved the most, and I quote, being paid to go camping. Exploring, exploring the lands is where he was the happiest, at ease, and at rest. Being in the field for four months at a time of solitude was delightful, or so I thought, until I received a letter from here, him near the end of four months of field work asking me, did you know Caribou had nice legs. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I knew he was bushed and time to return to civilization. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of Bob, I'd like to thank his loving brother, Dave, my twin, Bonnie Carson Hall, his pool playing partner, which usually started at 3 a.m., in the local tavern, Lenny Little, our godson, Ted Barnett, former Kaminko colleague, and of course Lee Barker, former colleague, as well as his spouses for attending this evening. And Lee, this, when I get it, is for you. I'm not for Lee. Hans, this is for you when I get it, wherever he disappeared to on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Graham and Ines. And um, we'd like now to take another moment to thank uh, this evening's uh, gold sponsors. So this is kind of the halftime, you know, uh, football, same thing. So please, the video. We would like to thank this year's gold sponsors. Agnico Eagle, a senior Canadian gold mining company producing precious metals since 1957. BMO Capital Markets one of the largest diversified financial service providers in North America. Gold Corp, a leading gold producer with long life, high quality assets throughout North and South America. Onger's Berenson, a leading executive search firm working with businesses across Canada, helping them develop their talent. Paradigm Capital, an independent investment dealer dedicated to enhancing performance and growth in the mining sector, and Tech Resources, a devoted supporter of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame and Canada's largest diversified resource company, focused on exploring, developing, and acquiring world-class, long-life assets in stable jurisdictions. Thank you to our sponsors. And we now celebrate and explore the career of A. Terence McGibbon. Let's learn more. Most people would enjoy retirement after a long, successful career. But after 30 years at INCO, Terry McGibbon was just getting started. Yeah, well, it, retiring the first time uh, was, I think I had six hours off because I uh, retired at midnight and, uh, on uh, the last day of October and uh, started at 8 in the morning on the first day of November. Since his retirement, Terry's name has become synonymous with the phrase, company builder. 
I think one of the most important things about Terry is that he has, he has a great vision and he sees value. He certainly sees things early and he is able to get people organized around opportunities. And I think he's one of those born leaders. He has been able to put the right people in place at the right time with the right deposits. He's been extremely successful and that's just no coincidence. That's not luck. Mining wasn't Terry's first career choice. Born to a family of nine in New Waterford, Nova Scotia in 1946, Terry's first love was athletics. The high school basketball team uh, we were on won the Canadian Juvenile uh, Championship and the whole team was put in the Nova Scotia Sports Hall of Fame. His chosen university didn't have a phys ed program, so Terry enrolled in pre-dentistry. And then uh, took a geology course and fell in love with geology and so uh, the rest of my life I spent uh, time drilling holes in rock instead of in teeth. With his degree in geology, he landed a job at INCO as a beach geologist in Sudbury. I uh, spent the next number of years working out of Toronto, doing exploration uh, in North America and, uh, and internationally as well. And I was fortunate enough to uh, travel to and work on every continent in, uh, in the world except Antarctica. Since retiring from INCO, Terry has been instrumental in the creation of four new mining companies. The first company he created was FNX Mining, that won a bid to buy previously producing mine properties from INCO. We had one employee, me at the time. We had no money, and we had a uh, market capitalization of uh, between five and $10 million. We generated uh, $300 million um, in revenue each year, and we had about $75 million in retained earnings. So it really was a, a great success story. We ended up becoming the number one stock performer on the TSX in the first decade of this century. In 2010, FNX Mining merged with Quadra Mining to become a growing copper producer that soon attracted the attention of KGHM, a large Polish copper company that made a successful bid for Quadra FNX in 2012. In 2010, Terry formed Torex Gold Resources and acquired the Morelos Gold Project in Mexico. Key to getting support in Mexico for the project were long-term land leases and acceptance by local community groups. Terry and his Torex management group, led by Fred Stanford, had to deal with the ongoing challenges of community blockades. Fred and his team went in and treated them with respect. He included them in the decisions we were making and were uh, trustworthy and honest with them. And Fred was able to get a uh, 25-year land use agreement from those very people that uh, didn't want any mining. Terry also has a project in Ecuador with his daughter Candace. When other companies were leaving Ecuador, they decided to buy 100% interest in an IM Gold project. We are doing a, um, a feasibility study now, and if everything goes uh, as uh, we hope, we should be in production there in 2020. Terry's current focus is TMAC Resources, his namesake company, and the Hope Bay Project on the Arctic coast in Nunavut. Acquiring Hope Bay was like, like acquiring Timmins in 1910, uh, without any mines and then developing them. There are three known deposits in the belt. The first mine, Doris, started production in 2017. Now we plan to use the uh, Doris proceeds to uh, bootstrap the development of the rest of the belt. Terry says his success revolves around the great teams he's been able to build. He invests in people, he, you know, he, he can have a vision for the potential of a person, you know, the same unique way as he has a vision for the potential of an ore body. Celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary in 2018, Terry says the business success is really about family. No matter how much you accomplish in business, the, the joy of seeing your family and seeing your family well and happy is, is, uh, is the greatest joy that you can have. 20 years after his retirement from INCO, Terry shows no signs of slowing down. I'm 71 years old now, probably working a little bit harder now than I probably uh, planned on. As long as you're healthy, and as long as you can continue to do it, I don't see uh, any reason uh, to stop.
And here to present Terry's award is Glenn Nolan, Government Affairs for Noront Mineral and a director of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. So please, Terry, Glenn, come to the podium. It's a working man I am, and I've been down. I never again will go down underground. At the age of 64. Terry McGibbon, a geologist, company builder and mine developer, is known for his perseverance, patience, and passion. It is my privilege to present Terry McGibbon with this award of honor and welcome him into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Terry. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, it's not only an honor to be uh, introduced by, uh, by Glenn, and it's a particular honor to recognize Glenn as a uh, Indigenous chief in the uh, First Nations group. Uh, there you are. And uh, it is so important to us in the mining business to respect all of our Indigenous people that we are associated with and to treat them with respect and, and with dignity that they deserve. Because uh, as we say in none of it, we are going in on their land and we are guests and we have to treat them properly and uh, in Canada I'm very proud that many many mining companies do that so anyway <laughs> Pierre I promise you that is the last impromptu thing I'm going to do I'm so terrified that Pierre is going to give me the hook that I'm going to read this text very carefully and finish in six minutes and 39 seconds I'm sure most of you recognize that song. It was sung by Cape Breton's Men of the Deeps. I am honored tonight to have as a guest at our family table my brother-in-law, Carmen Hughes, who sings with the Men of the Deeps and came here from Cape Breton Island to celebrate this event with Cynthia and our family. I would first like to thank my nominating committee who worked very hard for me to receive this great honor. I would also like to thank all of my friends and colleagues who wrote such supportive and informative letters to the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame Selection Committee. Reading them brought back great memories and smiles and tears. I also thank the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame and its Selection Committee for honoring me tonight and inducting me into the Canadian Mine Hall of Fame. I can tell you, I certainly never dreamt when I applied to University of New Brunswick to go into the phys ed, and then to my alma mater, St. Avax, to go into pre-dent, that I would, when I started my career in mining some 50 years ago, that I would be joining such a distinguished group of Canadians who have made such a tremendous positive contribution to the mining industry in Canada and throughout the world. It really is very humbling to be included with such great inductees like the people that Pierre had mentioned. I'm also very proud to be inducted with Ed, Ross, and, and Bob. Very, very worthy inductees and I'm, it, it really is a special treat tonight for me. Most of all, I would like to thank Cynthia and my three children, Darren, Candace and Steve, who have blessed us with six fabulous grandchildren. Everyone in this room knows the sacrifices our families make to allow us to pursue our careers and to be successful. I remembered that I missed Darren's and Candace's high school graduations because of a very important business event, but today I can't remember what that event was. So really, how important was it? Cynthia and I were childhood sweethearts who went to our first prom together. 
as teenagers. We have been together ever since, and we'll be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary this September. And believe it or not, an event that I look more forward to than even tonight. <laughs> to this day, she is the most beautiful and wonderful woman in the world. <laughs> How blessed am I? I told them I wasn't going to get emotional, but I am. Anyway, now I can get on to business. I was very fortunate. I had, as you, you saw in the video, I, I really had two careers in mining. The first 30 years I was with the former International Nickel Company of Canada and explored on every continent except Antarctica. I was extremely fortunate to work with many outstanding professionals, many of whom are still my dearest friends. After 30 years with Mother Inco, I decided to take early retirement and to see what I could do on my own and started a second career as an entrepreneur and mind builder. One of the principles I applied to these endeavors is that you can never improve on what Mother Nature has done. However, you can improve sometimes on what things man has done. This is why we have had success in acquiring non-core assets from large mining companies and then applying out-of-the-box strategies, non-layered decision-making, and entrepreneurial thinking, and why we're able to turn these non-core and sometimes abandoned assets into great mines and companies. In many cases, the major mining companies we acquired the non-asset, non-core assets from became our largest shareholders, partners, and friends. Randy Ingle, Newmont's EVP of Corporate Development, is here tonight. Randy and Newmont are great partners and have been great supporters and shareholders of TMAC Resources. Without them, we have never been able to take the Hope A project from care and maintenance to commercial production in just four years. Several folks from Resource Capital Funds are here tonight. RCF believed in TMAC when nobody else did and have been very supportive, both financially and personally, and are excellent partners. Our other partners at Hope Bay are the Katikmiat Inuit Association. Stanley and Paul have traveled all the way from Cambridge Bay. But in fact, you know, two weeks ago, it was colder here than it was in Cambridge Bay, and none of it. Thank you. None of it is one of the best mining jurisdictions in the entire world. And we have a great relationship with the KIA that is based on trust, transparency, and respect. Steve Letwin and all of the great folks at IM Gold have been extremely supportive of INV Metals. And without them, INV Metals would not be able to produce, pursue its plans to put the Loma Larga Gold Project in Ecuador into production in 2020. I am particularly proud of INV Metals as my daughter, Candace McGibbon, is INV's CEO. Jim Klukas and Bob Bell, both former INV CEOs, are here tonight. Thank you. Uh, a great asset is certainly necessary for success, but by a long shot, people are the most important requirement for success. I have been blessed to have worked with some of the best and most talented and ethical people in the mining business. A lot of them in, are in the room. I, I will mention some, and obviously I can't mention everybody. Lawyers like Jay Goldman, mining consultants like Graham McClough and Deborah McComb, auditors like Lee Hodgkinson, whoever thinks an auditor. <laughs> Investment bankers like David Scott and Jason Neal. Jason Neal at BMO and I have worked, I've been involved in over $14 billion of M&A transactions and have raised over $4 billion in equity financings over the past 20 years. Thank you, Jason. Fred Stanford, like me, spent most, almost 30 years at Inco before joining me at Torex as its CEO. Fred, on a handshake, worked for two months trying to raise the initial capital for Torex without any idea of compensation or his future. His wife was not happy. <laughs> we both knew that if we didn't raise the necessary 200 million to buy the Morales project from Tech, well, Fred wasn't going to get paid anyway and he wouldn't have a job, so why bother with a contract? We raised the money and Fred and his team went on to build a fabulous project, Morales in Mexico. Albeit, we are having some difficulties there right now, 
but it is and it will continue to be a great operation. When I think about FNX Mining, I can get quite emotional, as it was my first venture, and we not only were successful, but we had lots of fun. I, I, I almost went off script, but I wouldn't. And I made some incredible friends during the FNX days. I remember the early days at Highs, where guys like Rob Cudney, Barry Gordon, Rob Pollock, Bill Ballard, and Pat DiCapio would meet over a beer. I learned so much from them, as I did from Mike Weckerly back in the GMP days, and Bill Shaver and Bob Dangler from Dynatech. Many of the FNX folks joined me to make TMAC Resources a great success. People like Ron Gagel, who was on the video, the best mining CFO in the business. Gordon Morrison, the best mine finder in the business. Dave Constable is here tonight, the best IR person in the business. Catherine Farrell, who went from a research geologist to TMAC CEO, all very gifted and dedicated professionals. I'm often asked about success, and I always say, in addition to great people, great assets, you need what I call the three Ps of success. Perseverance, passion, or patience, and above all else, passion. Thank you very much. You gotta admit, those Irish, they do have the gift of the gab, don't they? They're wonderful. Congratulations, Terry. It's really an honor to have you in the Mining Hall of Fame. And now, but not least, it is time to recognize our frugal... Um, <laughs> I don't know if I should go to say... I, frugal nerd, yes. <laughs> Ross J. Beatty. And by the way, um, he is a newly minted member of the Order of Canada. Please, let's learn more about Ross. Anyone who thinks the environment and mining don't mix hasn't met Ross Beatty, a successful mining entrepreneur and passionate environmentalist who is leading the industry in responsible mining practices. He has an influence that he doesn't even realize because uh, people watch him because he's doing uh, visionary things in the industry while at the same time uh, doing real leadership things in society. Everything has an impact. We just have to understand the impact and mitigate it to make it as low as possible and at the end of the life of the mine, try to make things revert to, to their original state as much as possible. He has real credibility when he talks to NGOs and other stakeholders in the community because they know that, that he believes it's, it's in his heart and soul. But I, I love the beauty of the outdoors. It speaks to me, it's my church, it's my, it's my religion. Born in Vancouver in 1951, Ross Beatty's love of nature and geology started at an early age. Got my first rock collection when I was about eight years old. I got a rock hammer when I was nine to my mother's horror. And it's, it's something that lured me into geology. I loved everything about it. After obtaining a degree in geology at the University of British Columbia, Ross went looking for adventure traveling the world. The orange is where I've been. With a stop in England to obtain a master's in geology at the Royal School of Mines. His early work experience took him back to nature. I worked every summer in the bush with different mining companies exploring for minerals. I loved every minute of it. I just loved it. I, I was paid to hike and paid to camp paid to fly around in helicopters. I just thought, you know, pinch me. I mean, I would have done it for free. After returning to the University of British Columbia to obtain a law degree, Ross started his first company, BT Geological Limited. I wanted to work for myself all the way through. I, I didn't want to be an employee of anyone else. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. He also started his first public company, Equinox Resources, which eventually bought BT Geological. I had all my family in it, I had all my friends. We, we raised uh, the grand total of $145,000 in our IPO in 1985, and, uh, and most of that was my family and friends' money. It turned out to be quite a success, and it led on to many other 
fun and successful ventures. The foundation of Ross's success is based on his knack for recognizing the future potential of mineral properties, purchasing them, and monetizing them successfully. That talent led him to create 14 public companies. Ross has been consistently one of the most successful uh, mining entrepreneurs in the industry. He, as a young person, I think understood the cyclical nature of the mining business. Ross was able to be decisive and make counter-cyclical investments. By far the most the sizable and quite frankly most satisfying has been Pan American Silver. Today it's the second largest primary silver mining company in the world. We have about 7,000 employees, uh, seven mines in Latin America, three in Mexico, uh, two in Peru, one in Bolivia and one in Argentina. Ross's environmental and business interests cross over with one of his companies, Altera Power Corporation. It started as a geothermal power company but now includes wind and solar power. It's Ross's success in mining that has allowed him to contribute to environmental causes. He's probably the best example we have in the mining business of someone who uses their success for good. He often says that whatever his next venture is, he hopes it does very well so he can give the money away. I've seen him make uh, generous donations that that his name's never published, nobody knows it. He's just an extraordinary, modest and generous fellow. We have set up a foundation called the Sitka Foundation, and through that, currently, we're funding about 74 different groups across Canada, which are all dedicated to preservation of the environment and production of biodiversity. Concrete examples of Ross's generosity and dedication to the environment sit on the UBC campus. So this is the museum, profiling all of nature's beauties. There's about two million different species here. And then right on that side is a research facility, which is a biodiversity research center. Ross was also a major contributor and chair of the committee that raised $75 million to build the new Earth Science Building. It's just been very satisfying being part of this. Uh, the result is, is not only uh, functional, but it's beautiful and it's going to last a long time. It's going to, uh, it's going to educate you know, great students that will help build great companies in the future. Ross has also made major contributions to organizations like the Museum of Nature in Ottawa and Panthera, a wildcat conservation group. I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to keep you know, working to build the Canadian industry as, as successfully as possible, with as good a reputation as possible, work with great people, help other teams, and uh, continue to promote our business as a good thing. And here to present Ross's award is uh, Patricia Dillon, president of Mining Matters and a member of, and a director of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Ross and Patricia, please come to the podium. Lovely choice. Ross Beattie, a brilliant geologist and entrepreneur, as you saw in the video. He has an incredible passion for mining, the environment, biodiversity, and my own passion, education. Ross is a leader and a champion in all his endeavors, and I am very proud to present this award to Ross and to welcome him into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Ross Beattie.
Thank you, Pat. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to all of the people who helped kind of get me here in the Hall of Fame uh, group and people who wrote letters and so on. So I had a, a debate for quite a while whether to make this, you know, these remarks short and funny or kind of longer and more serious. And, you know, you can't beat Pierre at being short and funny. <laughs> so unfortunately for all you guys, it's going to be long and serious. You could flip that to be kind of boring, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be what it is. So, um, as the video showed, you know, I started this business when I was 18 years old. I got my first job in the in the bush, and uh, I just couldn't believe it. I was being paid to camp and hike and roam around the hills. Uh, it was uh, it was wonderful, and I and I certainly never expected to be standing here. I know Terry and, and Ed are probably feeling the same thing. Um, you know, but here, here I am. Uh, but I found I was good at building companies and uh, creating wealth for shareholders. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was something I was, I was okay at. I certainly never did it to win awards. I did it because I'm a classic entrepreneur. You know, you know the kind, selfish, greedy, impatient, all those, all those good traits. But even with those traits, you cannot succeed in this business without being lucky. And I've been most lucky by having had the chance to work with so many people who have helped me look good. And I'm going to thank a lot of you now. In fact, actually, I'm going to thank every single person in this room. In fact, I'm going to thank thousands more beyond this room. And I'm going to do it in five minutes. So keep the hook. Four. <laughs> I've been, I'm going to start by thanking my teams, of course, my, my, my great uh, colleagues who have helped me along the way. My first thanks goes to my first partner in my first company, John Wright, who's here tonight. And then all the team who helped me build Pan American Silver, especially Jeff Burns, Steve Busby, Andres Dasso, Rob Doyle, Martin Wafford, and Michael Steinman, who are here tonight, and all my Lumina team, Leo Hathaway, Lyle Bratton, David Strang, Aziz Sharif, Marshall Koval, and Scott Hicks, who are here tonight, plus Robert Pruse. They've all been an enormous part of my success. But you know, there are so many others who really need to be acknowledged tonight because nobody can build mining companies themselves without immense help from so many others. And I've had success because Canada has such an amazing mining ecosystem that supports people like me. So really, my remarks today are all about, to me, a really a celebration of Canada's mining industry. And, and you, you, you'll be surprised, kind of like Ed, uh, but I'm going to start with a shout out to Canada's mining lawyers and all the lawyers who work tirelessly, tirelessly, tirelessly behind the scenes to complete deals and financings and to do so much of the detail work that I've relied on to make deals happen. How many here tonight are lawyers? Lyle, Chris, <laughs> Freddie, don't be ashamed. Put your hands up. <laughs> Thank you all. And then, yes, just like I think it was uh, Terry who said, what about the auditors? Don't, <laughs> those are bright. Uh, <laughs> was that an account? Anyway, I want to give a shout out to the accountants. It's true. Who else would do the dreadful work to make our financial statements compliant? Accountants, wave your hands in the air. This is for you. There's got to be a few of you here. Rob Doyle. You are really the unsung heroes who make our financial system work so well. Again, you'll be shocked when I say this, but I also want to thank the investment bankers and brokers. They help make our deals happen. And the mining analysts, who have the toughest job in the industry, they have to be good to everybody. It's a tough, tough job. You help us buy and sell deposits in companies, you help raise money, and you connect shareholders, shameless promoters like me, to real people with real money who buy our dreams. So thank you too. Now I thank what Norm Keevil tonight called the real people. And that's the geologists and the engineers. The geologists and the engineers who do so much hard work in the field to find the minerals and figure out how to extract them profitably. I never found any mines. I never built any mines. I just had great colleagues who did, including all the consultants and support teams who helped us. How many are here tonight? Geologists, engineers, consultants? Thousands of you, thousands and thousands. Thank you all. And let's not forget again, 
some unsung heroes. Actually, I'm gonna give a shout out to the securities regulators. People in the OSC, <laughs> it's probably the first time ever. <laughs> OSC, BC Securities Commission, TSX, and all the other government officials and politicians who set up the framework for our world-class stock exchanges that help people and institutions from around the world to invest in our companies. It's not an accident that Canada is the world's greatest mining investment capital. I know there are a few of you here tonight, you don't have to put your hands up, but it's time that people like me acknowledge your importance in making mining companies like mine attract global capital. So thank you. And what about our great industry associations who work tirelessly to lobby for better rules that make our system work better? The PDAC, AIMBC, Provincial Mining Associations, the CIM, provincial, uh, sorry, Professional Engineering and Geological Associations, and so on. And all the people who work as conference organizers, newsletter writers, investor relations people, they're all part of the ecosystem that makes our industry great. You've helped me, and so I thank you. And speaking of global capital, I want to thank the investors, these poor suffering investors in the world, and those in the room. You are the ones who buy the dreams of people like me. Your capital fuels our drills and actually builds our minds. Without investors, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. And then there are all, there are all the people who work tirelessly, tirelessly behind the scenes doing the busy work, our office staff, our administration staff, Believe me, nobody can be inducted into the Hall of Fame without having enormous help from all of you. So thank you too. Now it may also be strange for me to thank my fellow entrepreneurs and colleagues in, the mining, in other mining companies who are here tonight, including my dear friends Ramon Davila and Jaime Gutierrez, who are here from Mexico and run mining companies in Mexico. And also my dear friend Jose uh, Picasso Salinas from Vulcan in Peru who've given me the great honor of coming here tonight. Thank you. There can surely be few other industries with such close friendship between competitors as the mining industry. And this is because, of course, we don't need to compete to sell our products. We sell in world markets. But there are innumerable instances where we work together to reduce costs, solve common problems, and make our individual businesses better. And long may this continue. It might also seem strange for me to thank the many NGOs and watchdog groups that, in, that involve themselves in our business. These include environmental groups working to protect the myriad of species affected by our minds, such as the Canadian Museum of Nature here tonight, and the indigenous and local community protection groups so vital to ensuring our social license to operate. If I degrade the environment or fail to gain social license, I haven't really succeeded at all. And finally, I want to thank all the spouses and partners and families of the many people who have helped me build my companies and all the other companies in our great Canadian mining industry. You know the expression, behind every successful man is an astonished woman. <laughs> well, it's those partners and their families who often have to sacrifice so much to support the guys like me who get all the awards. It's time all of us promoters give a shout out to all of them for their silent support from behind the lines. Well, usually silent support. <laughs> my son John is here tonight representing my wife Tricia and my other four kids who spent so many days and weeks without their husband and father while I roamed around the world chasing my dreams. So I hope I've thanked each one of you here tonight in your own way. You have made me look good and you've helped build our world-leading Canadian mining industry without which I would not be standing here. I've had an absolutely wonderful ride. You're all, you are all part of my proud in, in, uh, induction into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Ross. It's been 
as you say, a great, a great ride. And that, ladies and gentlemen, pretty well wraps up the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame 30th anniversary induction ceremony. Thanks to everyone for attending this record-breaking event to celebrate and reflect back on our first 30 years and the achievements that continue to support us as world leaders in mining. We're very, very proud of what we've achieved together and equally excited about what is to come in years ahead. Now, please join me once again in showing appreciation to our sponsors. The logo will show up. And, a, and also, I'd like to say a special thank to Syncrude Canada for sponsoring our beautiful new awards. They're really terrific. So thank you, Syncrude Canada. Thank you. <laughs> Tell you one thing, they're heavy, that's for sure. Uh, thank you uh, to the many organizations without whom tonight would not be possible. And uh, finally, enormous thanks to all of you for coming this, to this evening and for celebrating Canada, Canadians, mining industry's leaders. That wraps up the whole evening. The bar will continue to serve for half an hour, so please top up your glass, reunite with friends, colleagues, shake hands, uh, brainstorm for nominees for next year and start dreaming about what can become of the next 30 years. Until next year, thank you and good night. <laughs>